we must be fired up with ideas by now of how we can each make a difference when it comes to tackling climate change. But there is always more that we can do. And from this uh, next discussion, let's see if we can come up with further tangible action, what we can each do, who we could write to, who we could lobby. I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear from all of us. Um, <laughs> joining us uh, here this evening for this call to arms from here onwards. We've heard about from Natalie, but we're going to hear from her again in a minute. Natalie Fee, as we know, founder of City to Sea and uh, environmental campaigner. Leo Murray, co-founder, uh, director of innovation at the charity Possible, which enables people to take practical action on climate change. And I've seen him described as a serial activist entrepreneur. Richard Black's an old colleague of mine from the BBC, former BBC Science and Environment correspondent, but now director of the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, a non-profit organisation that supports informed debate on energy and climate change issues in the UK. And Harriet Lamb, the CEO of Ashton, an organisation that supports and promotes sustainable energy enterprises around the world. Harriet is the former CEO of International Alert, and Executive Director of the UK Fair Trade Foundation. Please welcome your panel. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have some questions from you all later, so I uh, don't, don't feel that we're going to um, let you go home without having those answered. But um, I just would like to start with Harriet for a, a moment. Just give it, make a few opening comments, if you would, Harriet. Of whatever like, type you like, tell us about Ashton and, and what you do and how you got involved. Right, well, I guess if you um, start, thanks for that brilliant uh, overview, Natalie, starting with what we can do as individuals. And I think from there, you can then go to, well, what can I do at work? And what can I do in my kids' school? And what can I do at my university? And then also, what can I do with local authorities or indeed national governments? And what Ashton does is seek to put the spotlight on innovative solutions to climate change here in Britain, but also around the world, in order that we can scale them up and replicate them. Because I think there are so many amazing solutions out there. And although it can all feel very uh, overwhelming and depressing, actually the solutions are there and we do just need to get behind them. So just to give you one example, actually this year we always have our annual awards here at the RGS, so it's nice to be here again. And in fact, we have our call to entries out now. So if you know inspiring organisations who deserve to be recognised, please put them forward now. But one of our winners last year was Waltham Forest, the local authority just up the road on the tube, if some of you might even live there. And They've done an amazing piece of work about really looking about how do we tackle air pollution in the borough and actually working together, not just in isolation, a bit like that earlier talk from France, not just the environmental piece of the local authority, but working, for example, with the health side of the local authority and looking at how can you get the health budget behind the really radical measures we need to take to close off roads, to encourage more people to cycle, to encourage more people to walk. And at the beginning, they faced so much opposition because, of course, local traders were worried, well, what would it mean for them? Would business go down? What would it mean for them getting their uh, goods delivered to the shop? But actually, all the uh, research has shown that having that integrated plan, where they didn't just do one little thing, they didn't just close the roads or just encourage to cycle, people to cycle, they had a really integrated plan that it has actually really had enormous benefits. And the shopholders who were worried in the beginning have actually seen more people coming to shop because the road's been pedestrianised. And in fact, research by King's College London has shown that since they started this in 2013, the children born since then are living already, on average, six weeks longer. And that's the key. Because although many of us here, still at 9, 9.010 on a, on a Friday night, which I think shows how committed some people are to the climate, <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> Most people, let's be frank, are not this committed. Most people have other things they're worried about in their lives. And what's so critical is that the things we do for the climate also benefit people in other ways. Everyone cares about their health or the health of their children. So the fact that children can now live six weeks longer by those measures, that's an amazing uh, way to talk about the issue with the public and keep them engaged. Yes, we'll talk more, I think, about the co-benefits in a little while. Richard? 
Yeah, so uh, individual action. I, I saw a tweet the other day from someone in America um, who was talking about, she was saying she, she, she had kept having discussions about what was the low carbon uh, Thanksgiving dinner that she should have. And she said her answer was, have a real conversation about how you could influence the political process and then eat whatever the hell you want. <laughs> And that, I think, is the right. I mean, there's absolutely no harm in taking individual action. Of course, it's fantastic. Whatever you do, some of the stuff that Natalie was laying out. And uh, I think the last time I was in here, actually, was for an Ashton Award, which was amazing. I, it's one of my favorite uh, uh, things out there. But um, the major changes that we're going to see are political. And certainly in the past, our government, for example, if we go back to sort of you know, 2008, 2009, they were regularly getting accused of uh, sort of putting the onus on individuals to take as, as an excuse for not doing things at the political level, and that is still very relevant, I think. Um, so I, 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 I gave a couple of talks um, to my mum's University of the Third Age group in the middle of Norfolk over the last few years. Terrifying experience, 130 retired, really intelligent people. Um, but uh, they all wanted to know, what, what can we do? And I, I had a list of 10 things, but my, my number one was talk to your elected representative. So, and I think that there's a real story of, of, of hope here um, about the influence of public opinion. We, we, we've been, uh, Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, we've been in existence for just over five years. In fact, we had our fifth birthday party uh, last night. And when I was trying to um, assemble what, what, we've, what we've done, what have been our key contribution, the sort of phrase I came up with is that we've helped give a, vi a voice to the silenced majority. Uh, on the particularly people on, of a, you know, on the political right, not necessarily in politics, but people whose instinctive uh, political views are of the right, help them to actually give voice to what they've always felt and always believed. And w when, when we started, we did a survey, for example, showing that, you know, as always, 70, 80 percent of the people uh, of the British public like renewable energy. But only 5% of the British public knew that the British public liked renewable energy. <laughs> and so, of course, once you actually... That's a bit meta, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a bit meta. Oh, it, it, but, but, but it's really important because yeah, if people don't think that other people like renewable energy, they'll assume that people don't like it. And, and therefore, politicians will assume that people don't like it. And of course, you know, the, the media in the past played quite a role in putting this kind of misinformation out there. But anyway, the, 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 the point of all this is that um, a couple of years ago, um, the, the conservative think tank Bright Blue did an opinion survey just after the 2017 election. They found out that climate change was the issue that young people wanted to hear most about from their politicians. In fact, across the board, there was a demand. Now, that led uh, to a group of conservative backbenchers, including some very Brexity backbenchers, having a dinner and deciding they quite like the UK to adopt a net zero target. And these are people that two years beforehand, they would not have done this. So that public uh, will, the public opinion, filtered through to people on the political right, and that's why we have a net zero target. And so that's there, my... There are, there are votes in it. Can I come back to you in a second, Harry? I just want to offer Leo the opportunity to speak. Tell us more about uh, possible and, and, and give us some of your opening thoughts. So possible, possible. we have quite a lot in common. There's overlap, actually, with everybody here on the panel. Um, it's not being thrown together. <laughs> what we try to do is um, practical, positive, collective action. And when I, you know, I co-founded it, we used to be called 1010 Climate Action, and we're probably people in the room who remember the original 10% campaign that we ran uh, all the way back in 2010. And the thesis at that point was that um, the environmental movement is dominated by negativity. And uh, I mean, that does continue to be true. Unfortunately, you know, the facts are quite bleak. And so, you know, engaging with the reality of this can be quite disturbing and, um, and you know, can inspire pessimism. Um, and that's not helped by the preoccupation of most of our peers in the movement being about stopping bad things from happening and talking all the time about how terrible it is. And so we realized that there was an unmet need uh, in civil society to promote uh, to promote solutions and to help people to feel uh, you know to, to feel like they can be a part of um, a big project to improve things <laughs> and uh, and so that's been our role ever since and I have to say it we have to recognize that um, 
it only works if someone else is also scaring people. So you, you, you've got to kind of, you know, people come to us for solutions because they've engaged with the gravity of the situation that we face. Um, and so, you know, we're very much part of an ecosystem here, but it was a very underserved bit of the ecosystem when we were first founded. It's somewhat better served now, um, but it is still, it's still, it's still a really important feature of this, you know. I mean, I've heard this repeated many, many times by many different people now, but, you know, uh, he didn't say, I have a nightmare. Um, you know, to inspire people, you need to have a positive vision of, um, of how things could be, um, not, just, uh, not just how awful they're gonna be if we don't do something. So uh, what we try to do is to uh, inspire and delight people to participate. And that is the absolutely crucial thing that has been missing from, um, that's been missing from the approach that we've taken in the UK to date. Now the UK's done very well on a relatively compared to other wealthy industrialized nations. You know, we have, uh, we have decarbonized faster than, um, than our peers. But we have done that effectively through a strategy of stealth where we, we've done it as nearly all the power sector um, and even the bits of that that impinge on people's consciousness, onshore wind turbines, you know, they're currently banned by the, by the present government um, because, you know, there's a tiny minority of people who don't like looking at them. Um, we need people to participate, and this next phase of climate action, the next 10 years, it won't work unless everybody is involved. And people like to join winning teams. You know, uh, as you said, Natalie, we're fundamentally social beings. We're not really fundamentally rational. We're fundamentally social. And there is, a, you know, there is abundant evidence for this. Um, there's a brilliant social science experiment. You sit somebody in a room on their own, and you tell them to fill out this form, and you'll be back in 10 minutes. And then smoke starts filling the room. They're immediately like, why is there smoke filling the room? They go up, and they go and get help. If you leave somebody in a room with a lot of patsies who, who you've brought in, so there's like five, you know, there's five, 10 people in the room, and your test subject is sat there, and you've asked, them, you've asked everyone to fill out a form, come back in 10 minutes, smoke starts filling the room. What that person does is they, che they check. What's yeah. everyone, What's everyone else doing? No one else is doing anything. Maybe it's fine. I, you know, I'm not going to. I'm. I'm just going to keep filling out my form. And um, you know, that is that is utterly consistent, right? And so that is basically what we've been doing for the last ten years. Is you know, people encounter this. Well, science is saying this. I'm, but I'm looking around. Everyone's just carrying on like everything is normal. So maybe I'll just. Keep acting like everything's normal. And I think the penny is dropping. Um, so I really feel like we're turning a corner on this. The first question I want to put to you all, and, and, and please do feel to sort of just chat, ignore me in a second. Um, chat so much. So this, I owe um, thanks to Joe Smith for, for this question. What solutions or actions or information on climate change is available to us now that wasn't available to us? a year ago, or something that you've come across in the last year, maybe, Natalie? Oh, my God. I mean, I just think so many reports. Um, hello to anyone who's come in that didn't see me just have half an hour. That's why I didn't get two minutes to introduce myself. <laughs> um, the, the, I think the, the media coverage now is much different to how it was. So I think there has been a, a, a change in how ready the reports are available. So I just think that I, I wouldn't be able to say one thing that's available other than the BBC are now showing shows at prime time TV about the climate. And, um, and we no longer feel um, compelled to offer balance. Which is good. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's sort of the, the amount of, in, uh, of information that's out there um, is, is, is far more accessible. Should I say false equivalence, not balance? Yeah. It's rather different. Um, yeah. I'll go good one. Greg's vegan sausage rolls. Yes. <laughs> that that is, you know, I'm not being just yes. being glib there. Like, I routinely eat them myself. But that's, um, you know, actually, like, Greg's is such a kind of iconic um, uh, entity in British popular culture. And, you know, they, they, they did this at this brilliant corporate tweet the other day saying, what shall we vegan next? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, and, and actually, like, it, it, you know, that is, that, what that, that's a bellwether. It's telling you there is fundamental social change taking place. 
Um, uh, so, you know, it's not just a sausage roll, basically. Yeah, 100% agree with that. The, 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 it, it is the perfect antidote to this whole thing about veganism being elite. I mean, it's got both the major food groups, fat and salt. Uh, <laughs> it is, it's exactly what you'd expect of Greg's uh, product to taste with it. It costs, what, pound £1.20? Yeah, one Wonderful. Pound. One pound. Utterly anti-elitist thing. This is what you have this morning after your party hangover from I, last night. I, I have one every morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do, I, every time I go through, like, London Bridge Station, where, where, which, you know, is my, is my, is my local, I, I, I find it very hard not to buy a Greg's vegan sausage roll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guilty secrets out. But, but you couldn't, you yeah. know, as uh, previously, yeah. vegans... Struggle to feed themselves, mm. right? Mm. You go to the sandwich aisle yeah. in, a, in, yeah. a, in a supermarket, there are no vegan sandwiches yeah. on the sandwich aisle. You know, it's a range of, I mean, I've been a vegetarian for many, many years, and I would just go, I, you know, it's egg or cheese, egg or cheese, what, what, do, I, what do I fancy today? Yeah. Whereas now, actually, you can, you can be a vegan and still eat yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> regular eateries, you know. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Uh, what I, else have you come well, across? Well, I, I, I just want to uh, uh, back up Natalie's point as well, and I can't, I have to, can I, Am I allowed to do a little plug? Of course you are. So, You're not uh, on the BBC now, Dan. Oh, wonderful. That's it. Well, in that case, um, no. Uh, so a, a year ago, I sort of, I sort of published, the, I think, the only book that looks, about, looks at this stuff in the UK called Denied, The Rise and Fall of Climate Contrarianism. It deals with how the, the contrarians sort of seized a lot of the media agenda and why they lost. So it's still available, I think. Amazon doesn't have a remainder bin, right? So we should be fine. Um, so I'll chuck another thing into the mix. Something that I'm quite excited about is, you know, every week there is a new bit of technology that comes on the scene. And for me, the one thing, one thing that's clear now that wasn't clear a year ago was that a certain amount of flying is going to be possible with electric planes. Um, it won't be, I think, the things that whisk you to, you know, Australia, but certainly the, the, the flying within, within Europe, for example, things like this, you know, a lot of it is going to be possible with electric planes, and sooner than we know it, with, there's possibility of uh, some, you know, planes starting to enter commercial service, with, you know, three, four, five years' time. So for me, that's an amazing thing. I think it's really cool. Let's talk well. about drone taxis as well and things like that. If yeah, you don't, don't get me started. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm don't not get me started. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the key thing is the, you know, the journey that you, you know, you have to make, like, you know, for, let's say from 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 here to here to, you know, Berlin or Brussels or something like this. Um, currently, it's, you know, it, it, you obviously. Obviously, the train is always going to be there, but let's face it, people fly for a reason, for a good reason. It's really convenient and really quick. So if you can do that by electric planes and obviously have your, you know, generation system renewables or low carbon or whatever, then that's great. Harriet. Well, I think there are technological solutions are coming through all the time. And one really interesting one is how do we get better about storing renewable energy? Because obviously that will be really key. Uh, so there's a company called High View Power that's found, don't ask me technical details, but they found a way to push the renewable and push air into the ground and then when you re when you need the energy you bring the air back up again and that actually gives you uh, the energy so i think that will be quite breakthrough when we can get better at storing renewable energy both individually at a community level and nationally but i actually think the key is changing consume is changing public behavior and that giving a, a mandate to the politicians to change their behavior uh, and that's why I know you weren't quite saying that, but that's why I think individual action matters so much. I know lots of environmentalists sort of feel they're banging their head against a brick wall and sort of, don't talk to me about plastic straws again, mm. but because other things will have a bigger impact. But actually, the point is plastic straws is a way for people to come into the debate, mm. and from then, they start to shift the political opinion, and that's what's happened, and that's I, where I'd we've like seen the complete yeah. change around in the atmosphere that gives, as we saw earlier, Theresa May, sort of gives her a mandate to come up and do that extraordinary thing that you wouldn't have predicted mm. a year before. And I think it's really interesting if you look at Ipsos Mori research on what do the public think. If you ask the public, do you care about climate change? Of course you get, you know, off the chart figures. Of course everyone says yes. If you ask the public, what do you care about most? They have other worries. They worry about the NHS, they worry about jobs, they worry about many, many other issues that infringe on their daily life. Crime, education. And over the past really 20 years, because we've known all the science for 20 years, the climate and the environment has just bumped along the bottom and it's never got over 10% of the public putting climate change forward 
proactively in response. And now that's up at 20%, and that's quite a change. That's a very significant shift. That's getting it to the same levels as education and crime, <coughs> which is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, and that's in one is. year. So I think that's what gives us, it's through individual action, you can get the political changes you need, both at the local authority level and at the national level. And then, let's hope, I mean, this is meant to be in the run-up to COP25 as a springboard for COP26 in Glasgow, then we've got to get the big international agreements as well. So I really want to pick up on this thing about individual action, because I know I've been kicking around climate discourse for long enough that I just, it's a very, very persistent false dichotomy in the discourse between systemic change and behavior change. Because actually individual action is not really what describing it as individual action, even though yes, it's, in, it's action you're taking about your own consumption choices as an, in, as an individual, it, it elides the most important function of it, which is we are all social agents. Now, actually, secretly becoming vegan is not a specially helpful thing to do. Um, you know, <laughs> the there, there's, vegan well, no, and that's what I was about to. You, you know, vegan. there's a joke about yeah, how do you, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. But, but 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 that, but basically, that the, the the value of us doing these things of you know, actually, the main value of putting solar on your roof is that. Is, is it, everybody can your see that you put solar too, right? on your roof, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that is true across all these different dimensions mm. of this. And, and, and that's why, you know, we started out as a, as a campaign to get everybody to voluntarily cut their emissions by 10% in a single year, because that was what the science was suggesting we ought to do back in 2009. And um, actually, over time, you know, we've, we've kind of, we've realised that the sweet spot actually is collective action at the community scale because you can affect outcomes that feel tangible and bigger than yourself. Yeah. Um, and, but, but, you know, we're here, to, we're here because of COP25, but COP25 is like, who in this room feels they can influence the outcome of COP25? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, not, you know, professionals. I know people who've been to every COP and they're not at all confident that they had any effect at all on the outcomes. But, but, but the thing is, the COPs depend on what individual governments do, and yes. if you have enough governments um, that are already prepared to do it, then... You, then but what individual happen. governments do is, you know, they will not move faster than they perceive the people yeah. to be moving. That's right. And that's why it matters so much mm. what and we do. Thanks. Just, just to pick up on that, like... Um, I'm, I'm from Bristol, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, I'm on the Bristol Advisory Committee for Climate Change. And we're heading, well, we've, we've agreed to go for net zero by 2030. So it's, I, think, I think we're the only city in the UK to, to be going to that. But that's come about through individual action as a result of our city councillors that have pushed for that. And that is still individual action. And, um, and I think it was mentioned earlier in the talks earlier about how although we may not be able to influence the, the real top-level politics, actually, in terms of um, our local councils, we can really influence that. And that is yes. exciting, isn't it? It's exciting. It's actually half of all local authorities have declared a climate emergency. And I think that's a real credit. I'm sure everyone in this room has been part of helping that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's amazing. And then we've got to build on that for the other half, but also to help those councils who have declared an emergency then put in practice the policies yeah. that will bring about the change. Because in a way, obviously declaring the policy, well, declaring the, 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 emergency. the emergency and declaring the sort of vision you have is one thing, and that was quite hard. And it's quite interesting how even, you know, councils like um, Bath and North West Somerset, you know, not your traditional left-wing councils full of Greens, they've declared it easily, unanimous, and then what, you know? Then yeah. your poor sustainability officer who was sitting in the corner and has no budget suddenly has their moment, and then they're asked to green the entire local authority's yeah. agenda. And that's when we've all got to pile in behind them and give them the ideas and the solutions, but also the mandate, because they'll have to make really difficult decisions, because it isn't all easy. We're, right from when we're really tiny, we, we learn cause and effect, don't we? Um, you press a button and you know, a toy will pop up, for example. Um, we we come, become very reward-driven, don't we, as, as human beings. You touched on it uh, earlier on, Harriet, about the idea of these co-benefits. If we've got to wait to see the reward of 
yeah. changing our behaviours. Some people will think, well, what's in it for me? Why should I do it? I'm not necessarily, it's like planting a tree, isn't it? You might not live to see it mature. Mm -hmm. How important is it, do you think, for people to see those co-benefits pretty instantly? I mean, I think some of the things you were maybe talking about, you could see the re reward fairly quickly. Yeah, well, like carrying reusable shopping bags. <laughs> Gets you jumping for joy. Um, <laughs> I think, I think it, you know, there are, you, you can feel the benefits, I think, very quickly of eating less meat and then you can talk about those you know pretty much within months of changing your diet if you're noticing increased energy or health benefits um the sort of the the smug feeling that you get when you're using reusable milk bottles instead of um instead of disposables those are they are instant gratification when you only have to put your bin out once a month instead of once every few days and those are the things that i think when people share those positive stories then people start to think that, oh, they could have that nice feeling as well. So I, I don't think, I think this sort of, the, the sense of like, oh, we need to save the future for our children, um, the fact that our children are speaking up about it now is helpful because it makes it more now and tangible. Um, but I think, I think a lot of the changes that we make do feel better very, very quickly. So, so, so that's, that's very interesting because, I mean, that you're, you're absolutely right. The most individual change is the one where you see the most, you feel the most benefit. But it's actually also the one that, in a sense, has, has the least impact on the, on, the, on the really big problem. You know, as Leo was saying, you know, community action obviously has more. And if, if you take something, let's say you decide that in your city you want to make it, um, you know, electric cars only within 15 years or something, you're not going to feel the benefit of that tomorrow or the year after or the year after that, know. the I clean air, air and everything like this. Yes, but, you, you, but it's not going to happen right, right then. It, you're still, you can see the progress of it, and that can give you satisfaction because you know it's going to happen. Mm. But actually, the thing about the kids, you know, not being anywhere near a tailpipe, for example, when they're in the buggy, that, might, that isn't going to happen next week. And, and for the really big picture, the, the, from the political change that actually changes the way, changes the policies, that turn the land into a carbon sink, for example, over 20 years, that over 20 years make sure that we're not using gas in our, to heat our homes, we're using heat pumps or whatever. You're not going to see any real gratification, instant gratification of that, and yet that's the stuff that matters most. Well, OK, I don't know. I don't know if I agree, because I think there are lots of things you can do that do make a difference quite quickly. So one example is better insulation of social housing. That means ve almost ve immediately the tenants have lower fuel bills and they're warmer and they're not mm. sitting in a draft. So that's an immediate benefit to them. And whether or not they care about the climate, everyone wants to live in a warmer, less drafty home. So that, yeah. and likewise, encouraging people to walk is an immediate health benefit. But I'd also like uh, perhaps to touch on <coughs> another issue that I think is really important, which is looking at making sure the transition is a fair one and that we're also tackling inequality at the same time. And I think that can be one of the benefits. So if, on the other hand, yeah, and actually both globally and uh, within this country, but if you just take this country, if you, having been to Waltham Forest, then go to Hackney or down to Brixton, and you go to some of the social housing there, there's a community energy group that have put solar panels on the roofs of some of those. They were actually the first uh, place in the country to put solar panels on council housing. And but the way they did it was equally important because they involved the community and they helped people who didn't have jobs, who were in trouble with the state. They enabled them to learn how solar panels work, to learn about energy, to help put them up on the roof. So there was an immediate benefit, actually, that some young people then got jobs, got skills, and got involved in it all. Uh, and then from there, they've gone, actually, to... They, then they thought, well, the problem is the panels are on the roof. So that whole thing about raising awareness, if it's social housing, the roof's quite high up, no gain in raising awareness. So they then thought, well, that's the problem. So they went to the wasteland by the railway tracks. You know, do you know there's a lot of wasteland by railway tracks? And they managed to get some of that to turn them into gardens, and, and in the gardens, using little solar panels as well, but also helping people learn to grow veg pretty fast, immediate benefit. And then they grew hops, and from the hops they made some beer. So I've got to recommend to you Energy Garden Ale. It's very fizzy, because it's the first time they've made beer. But if you put it in the fridge, it's good. And I kind of think that represents that energy that they've got about how do you go on to the next and the next. And that's definitely an immediate benefit. Stay, to go stay with, your Greg's, yeah. with your Greg's <laughs> vegan sausage, yes, you can have Energy Garden perfect. Ale. Dunked in the ale, yeah. I think that's the, that's the <laughs> We had this as a... 
we, we, we had this as integral to our strategy for a long time was to lead with co-benefits. So we ran a program called Solar Schools for five years. You know, we were putting solar on school roofs before almost anybody else. Um, that, what that project did was help school communities to crowdfund the costs of installing panels on the school roof. And the strategy, like the, the theory, was that by, everybody cares about the local school, right? So ba basically everybody cares about the local school, as close to uh, everyone as you can get, right? Um, we've atrophied community in this country over the last few decades, but schools are still very much community hubs. Everybody knows someone who goes there or some, you know, they know someone whose child goes there or they went there when they were a kid. And so people, people already care about that. And so starting from what do people already care about and then introducing a solution to climate change into that space um, was a really effective tactic. And it turned people who were you know, doing bake sales and um, you know, teachers getting sponges thrown at them and things into climate change activists because they, were, they, you know, they cared about the school and the school massively benefited, you know, it was a very generous feeding tariff regime um, at the outset, and you know, some of the schools we worked with were employing teaching assistants off the back of the income from, um, from the feeding tariff. Mm. But I just want to say that actually over the, last, over the last 18 months, two years, we don't need to do that now. So not everything that we're doing is leading with a co-benefit because mm -hmm. enough people are actually prioritizing climate change yeah that you don't need to kind of come at them obliquely with a, with a you know, this is, but, but we still have it as a test for all the projects that we run are, how will this improve people's lives today? There's another aspect of the fair transition that I think is really important that overall and campaigners have been really awful about thinking about, which is that in any transition, certain people will lose out. Mm. And unless you actually recognize that up front and talk to them and get them buy-in and find a transition, they're going to resist. Uh, and so, you know, for example, one thing, uh, as, as, as electric cars take over, we're not really going to need any mechanics because electric cars are so much simpler. So I don't know how many car mechanics there are up and down the length. I, I guess probably 20, 30,000 probably up and down the lengths of the country. Um, you talk about, you know, we talk about phasing out oil, which of course we're going to have to do, but you know, that means that Aberdeen and the, and the entire region is, is going to atrophy unless there's a plan. All of the shares that are, that are in pension funds, all the take that comes into the treasury, unless people actually think that through and have a plan, the people are going to kick back. So. Well, that brings us to the, the, the wider issue, doesn't it? I, I, can't, I can't bear shopping. I hate having to go shopping. I, yes. I used to have to, yes. I used to fib to my, my ex-husband about how much money I hadn't spent on things. <laughs> um, uh, but does it, how do we then move to that new future where at the moment productivity and consumption is the thing that we use to generate profit, to yeah. generate wealth. How do we escape that if so many people's mm. livelihoods are dependent upon that model? Buy, sec buy second-hand yeah. furniture. Yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, just for me, I, my, my sort of forte or passion is, is individual action. And, and I think for that, the first thing that I thought about was that generally we buy insane amounts of stuff because most of us are carrying some kind of pain or we're numbing out by by and and, and shopping is in a is one form of addiction so we buy things to make ourselves feel better because we're not used to just sitting with ourselves and actually being with ourselves and being still and being quiet and being out in nature or starting to to discover the inner world and i think the more people uh, become more self-aware, the more we spend time meditating, the more time we spend reflecting, actually we become happier people. The more we connect with our communities and do volunteering work, the happier we become, like fundamentally happier we become, the less stuff we buy. It's a, but the it's less a, stuff we buy, what do people do? Yeah, so job? That's, it, look, this, is, this, is, this is an excellent question. I think um, there is an answer. If you look back to Keynes, he famously looked at labor productivity trends from technology, and he projected them forward towards the end of the 20th century. And he said, I confidently predict people will be working a three-day week yeah. uh, by the turn of the century, right? But, but in fact, what happened to 
those gains was that we all carried on working. You know, in fact, we work more hours, you know, yeah. in the UK now than we did then. Um, we're not any happier. We've not got the we've not got the time that we had, but we consume massively much more material throughput than Keynes envisaged people could ever conceivably do. And you know, it hasn't made us happy consumerism. It's not a you know, it's not a model that has been a success um, on its own terms, even if it hadn't caused an environmental crisis. And so we are looking at a fundamental uh, reckoning with the socioeconomic model that we're following. following. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an economist. Um, I, I, you know, I'm interested enough in this, you know, because this is obviously, this is a very, very fundamental question. And I think that actually, uh, you know, the, it, gets, it gets characterized, it gets encapsulated as, as is growth, as this question around growth. But in fact, what has happened to economic growth, it just, even in the UK over the last little while, is that it is all captured by an ever-shrinking proportion of the population. Um, you know, there have been no real gains in wages for working people um, over the last uh, nearly 15 years because it's just a tiny, tiny proportion of people who are hoovering up all the gain. And you know, owning five private jets and so on. So I think that its days are numbered. I mean, I feel like this model is uh, running out of road very quickly. Um, the problem is, it's been described before as trying to turn a plane into a bicycle while it's moving. <laughs> um, you know, you basically because because if we don't get growth, you know, we see what happens if country if you know if countries fall into recession, there are very bad outcomes. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And so we have to find a way to retool our economies so that they are not dependent on perpetual growth. Mm. But actually, what needs to happen to, for decarbonisation, the transition, when you look at the amount of investment, the amount of infrastructure that needs to be radically you know, rethought over the next 10 years, there's no way for, for that to happen without a lot of jobs and growth. So I think that we basically need to spend 10 years pouring huge sums of money into our economies to completely reconfigure all of our infrastructure, but use that breathing space to also reinvent our economy so that they're no longer dependent on perpetual growth. I mean, it's not an easy yeah. challenge. Yeah, it's a really difficult one because any small business thinks in terms of growth. You know, I want to grow my, 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 my sales. I want to produce more. I want to, you know, grow a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, every, every high street shop wants to sell a little bit more than it did the last year. I think it's a natural instinct. And that's why it's so difficult, actually, because we're not talking about, you know, a group of 60 million people all thinking about it as one sort of hive mind and deciding. We're talking about lots of little actors all over the country that are all trying to do the same thing. I think, it, in, in a sense, we're obviously measuring the wrong thing, and there's a whole you know, suite of economics that's out there with different models that we could be Car crashes measuring. are great for the economy. Yeah, know, I mean, GDP. That, that's, you know, I'm sure most people will be familiar with all the, all the sort of alternative models that there are to GDP. And one simple thing would be for a political party to say, right, we're just going to stop using GDP as our main metric. And for financial journalists, actually, to start <laughs> yeah. using other metrics in, in what they do all the time. But I think the, the, the biggest thing isn't really um, the sort of growth. It, it's how, it's how, the, how the benefits are spread around. That's, that's the really key thing. And what, so what Leo said is absolutely right about a tiny, you know, and, and, the, and the other thing, of course, is that we've got ourselves into a situation, for example, here in London, where you have to keep earning more yeah. just in order to pay your rent yeah. and all of this stuff. Which is probably one of the things that Keynes didn't uh, didn't foresee. No, so, the, the level of rentierism, yeah. if you know that phrase, in our economy yeah. today. I mean, Adam Smith would be turning in his yeah. grave. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, it's just people just extracting value, but for contributing nothing. Mm. Yeah. Correct. Well, I think you need, we need to do two things, really. One is to, to, to redistribute, as you said, mm. and to have a massive industrial strategy where we would have enormous investment into uh, an alternative and new economic solutions. As we've begun to see a little bit of in parts of the Northeast, and it was, I was really, it was great that the woman from Teesside spoke earlier, there are parts of the Northeast where people have been retraining away from making oil rigs into making wind turbines, and it's how can you take more of those examples and 
invest also, though, it's not just about redistribution. I think it is also about really encouraging much more of an economy, from a much more democratized economy. So you are encouraging actually many more SMEs, and you're really encouraging many more small and local enterprises to flourish, which also bring lots of benefits in other ways, in social ways as well. And so I think we need to do that. But I also don't want to lose sight of the fact that the, we need a just transition actually between countries as well. It's not just about industrial countries being able to reinvent themselves. It's also about justice between countries like Britain that have caused this whole mess in the first place and countries like Zambia where in rural areas 80% of people don't even have access to electricity yet. So we've also got to look at how can we help countries like that find new ways actually where actually people need more access to power. Not less, but they need it. Let's find new ways to do it. And it goes back to the earlier question about population, which is clearly a problem on the one hand. And on the other hand, you know, Gandhi said 100 years ago, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. So we're going to have to consume less here in order actually that other people who are very, very poor and have no access to energy, and they do need to actually consume more. But, but the problem is, is how to do that. You know, if, 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 you, if, you think, if you think that's the thing to do in Britain, how are you going to persuade Britain to consume less? Because I, I don't have an answer. I can't see how it works.